Please turn in your Bibles to Esther chapter 1. Tonight, I'll begin a series through the book of Esther. Uh, Joe shared with you he's going to be working through part of Exodus. Um, I'll be working through Esther, and uh, next month sometime, the session is all going to meet, and we're going to talk about, some of you have asked who's preaching when and so on, and the answer is we don't know yet. Um, uh, but, but briefly, our, our initial plan is I'll, I'll work through Esther, he'll work through part of Exodus, and then we'll uh, see what happens next. Um, uh, but uh, just a little bit of background about this book as we begin. This, the events in the book of Esther take place uh, as best as scholars can figure it out around the 470s B.C., and that's uh, over 100 years after uh, the original deportation of Jews away from Jerusalem uh, when the Babylonians conquered them. Uh, they were taken, they were um, uh, spread out in various parts of the kingdom. Uh, you probably know stories of Daniel and his long life. By the time Esther happens, Daniel is gone uh, from the picture, uh, and the Babylonian Empire is gone. They've been replaced by the Persian Empire. Uh, and uh, Cyrus has already decreed that Jews may return. Some of the Jews have returned. They have uh, worked to rebuild the temple. Uh, but many others still remain spread out uh, across the kingdom of Persia. And that's where we'll find the characters in this book. Uh, and chapter 1 will be introduced uh, to this Persian empire. So give your attention to God's word, Esther chapter 1. Now it took place in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus, who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. In those days, as King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was at the citadel in Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his princes and attendants, the army officers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of his provinces being in his presence. And he displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days, 180 days. When these days were completed, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days for all the people who were present at the citadel in Susa, from the greatest to the least, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were hangings of fine white and violet linen, held by cords of fine purple linen on silver rings and marble columns, and couches of gold and silver on a mosaic of pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels of various kinds, and the royal wine was plentiful according to the king's bounty. The drinking was done according to the law. There was no compulsion. For so the king had given orders to each official of his household that he should do according to the desires of each person. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abiktha, Zethar, and Carcas, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princes, for she was beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. Then the king became very angry and his wrath burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for it was the custom of the king, so to speak, before all who knew law and justice and were close to him, Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marsena, and Memukan, the seven princes of Persia and Media who had access to the king's presence and sat in the first place in the kingdom. According to law, what is to be done with Queen Vashti? because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs. In the presence of the king and the princes, Memukan said, Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also all the princes and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands by saying, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought into his presence, but she did not come. This day the ladies of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's conduct will speak in the same way to all the king's princes, and there will be plenty of contempt and anger. 
If it pleases the king, let a royal edict be issued by him, and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, so that it cannot be repealed, that Vashti may no longer come into the presence of King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is more worthy than she. When the king's edict which he will make is heard throughout all his kingdom, great as it is, then all women will give honor to their husbands, great and small. This word pleased the king and the princess, and the king did as Memucan proposed. So he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province according to its script, and to every people according to their language, that every man should be the master in his own house, and the one who speaks in the language of his own people. This is, again, God's holy word. Well, people have always been kingdom builders. And so when we come to the kingdom of Persia, I suggest that this is not quite so far away from us as it may seem at first. Uh, It is a strange passage. It's a strange world, a foreign and exotic world. Uh, Something almost like what you might imagine would be going on in a fairy tale or, or some other story. But as we take a little bit closer look, I want you to think about how much this relates to us because you have this man Ahasuerus and he wants to be in control and God in his providence has given this man a great deal of authority and yet Ahasuerus finds himself frustrated by what he cannot control in this case his wife does not any of that sound like Anything you've ever experienced, wanting to be in control, family issues, all of those sorts of things, it's not quite as far away from us as it may seem. Because we are all kingdom builders. And I don't say that in a pejorative sense. This goes back to what you have in Genesis chapter 1, when God creates people and he gives them the original mandate, he says to them that they are to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We're designed to be kingdom builders. So let's take some time today and and ask yourself the question, how's your kingdom doing? How how does it look right now? As, As we look at Ahasuerus' kingdom, I think we're invited to look at our own little kingdoms. Are you in control of what you want to be in control of? Are you upset about anything? Is there anything that's frustrating you? What have you been building recently? This passage is inviting us to take that look at Ahasuerus, to ask the questions about his kingdom, ask about our kingdoms. But then as we do that, instead of simply evaluating and either being impressed or depressed by what we see, I think it's also moving our eyes to another kingdom, to consider the kingdom of God that rules over all and the hope that we have when we submit to his kingdom. So I want to ask you to do three things as you look at your kingdom today. First, watch out for kingdom camouflage. Watch out for kingdom camouflage. We must say Ahasuerus' kingdom looks really good. Probably better than yours or mine. You go through the list as we start. Verse 1, he has 127 provinces. Verse 2, he has an entire city, which is a citadel, a fortress, which can withstand attack, a royal throne set up. He has this vast army of men who are ready to serve him and obey him. And he has all the provisions he needs to give them this 180-day feast. Uh, It's a remarkable kingdom. And so what do you do when you have a kingdom like that? Well, verse 4, you show it off. Right, And he displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days, 180 days. It's a remarkable kingdom. Now, your kingdom probably doesn't include quite as much as his did, but I want you to to start thinking about what's in your control. What, What is a part of your kingdom? Probably you have... Uh, at least some food and clothing. Children, you probably have some toys that are your own. Uh, as, as you get older, you have other things. Maybe you own a car. Maybe you own a house. Maybe you have uh, money in the bank or some assets to manage, things like that. What's, what's a part of your kingdom? 
What do you own? And what do you do with it? You know, Ahasuerus is really just a typical man of the world. What do you do with whatever you own? You show it off. That's why, that's why you have it, is so that you can show it off, so that you can impress other people. It's, uh, you all know I've uh, purchased a house recently right over there. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, Google watches what you search for and things like that. As you look for things on the Internet, I get these ads popping up. Here, come look at uh, the, the houses owned by the 10 richest people in the world or, or check out these 10 incredible houses that you'll never be able to afford. Why do they show you those ads? Uh, it's not because they expect you to buy any of them. It's because in this world, when you have something nice, you show it off. That's, that's what we naturally do with our kingdoms. What do you do with your kingdom? You know, in the showing off, you, you can be clever. R- remember the Pharisees. This is what they were rebuked for. It's not, it's not that they did it perfectly according to the worldly pattern, but they knew just the right things. Here's how I show off as as I pray better than other people, or as I give money better than other people. They knew just how to show off. Let's go back, let's go back to the show. Verse 5, when all of these days were completed, so 180 days for all the officers from all around, uh, he then gives another feast, a seven-day feast, and this one is for everyone. Uh, from the greatest to the least. So every individual in, in Susa gets to attend this one. And again, verse 6, we see uh, the remarkable decorations that we have. Verse 7, we see uh, how he's able to provide food and drink. And uh, verse 8, he even shows his his generosity. He says, here are the rules. Everybody do what you want. Uh, I I want everybody to have a good time at this feast. That's, That's the rules that we're going to have. And so he gives all of those things. And then we have just this brief clue in verse 9 that maybe everything's not quite perfect. Because there's Queen Vashti, not at the king's feast, giving a banquet for some other people who apparently aren't at this feast. Even though the greatest to the least is invited, I don't know if this is women in general, perhaps this refers to the the harem that he certainly would have kept, Uh, but Queen Vashti and these other women are having their own feast apart from what King Ahasuerus is doing. It's an impressive kingdom But of course, as we look at this kingdom, we realize all of this is a facade. All this that he has on the outside is camouflaging what's really going on. King Ahasuerus has not achieved happiness in his kingdom. It's going to take just the slightest little bump in his kingdom, something to go wrong, and, and as we'll see in a moment, he just completely loses it. He, he, he gets angry. The whole world stops because not everything is going the way he wants it to. And we need to think about our kingdoms, too. We can spend a lot of time camouflaging our kingdoms, making sure everything looks good on the outside. You know, it's, it's interesting to think about the United States. The United States looks really good, too. This is a, a great kingdom. I know we share power in the United States. We don't have a monarch. But, uh, but it's, it's a, a, a country that the whole world looks to as a power. But we were bumped recently, weren't we? Coronavirus. And all of a sudden, not that everything was perfect before, but look how we fall apart. Look how we fight with one another in the United States. Look how we can't agree on even the smallest things together. What kind of kingdom do we have here in the United States? And of course, that's the analysis we need to do to ourselves. Uh, maybe, maybe COVID can help you with that. COVID probably bumped you individually too, not just bumping the whole nation. Maybe there are other things that have, that have made you wonder What's going on that have tempted you to get frustrated and angry and, and, and things aren't going quite the way that you wish they would? How much in your life is camouflage? Now, this, this is not to say it's bad to have good things. Uh, it's, not ba- it's not wrong to have a big kingdom. Uh, like I said, God made us kingdom builders. The building is fine. I want you to examine what you're doing with what God has given you. What are you using it for? Watch out 
for kingdom camouflage. You know, there's a, there's a solution if, if you struggle with this. If, if you recognize things aren't quite right, but I'm sure working hard to make sure they look that way, there is another kind of camouflage that Jesus proposes to you. We're going to turn a few times tonight to the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus talking about the kingdom of God. Consider what he tells us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Jesus suggests instead of camouflaging all the bad stuff and covering it up with good stuff, consider camouflaging the good stuff. Consider living your life not before men, but living your life before God so that God will be the one who gives you your reward for whatever you are able to build. He goes on uh, just as an example of the teaching in chapter 6. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And all of chapter 6 is worth reading and thinking about. I'll just go to the end of the chapter as he Uh, He finishes up talking about anxiety and worry. Verse 31, he says, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You don't have to get rid of the good things God has given you, but he suggests you should use them not for your own kingdom. Use them to serve the kingdom of God. Watch out for kingdom camouflage. The next thing I want you to do as you think about your kingdom is to take note of kingdom crises. Take note of kingdom crises. Watch what happens when things go wrong. Let's go Back to Ahasuerus, uh, Esther 1, verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abathag, Zithar, and Carcass. And if you wonder why all the names, I think the Bible is showing us how he shows off. It's, it's showing us his, his pomp that he has. The seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princes. For she was beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. And the king became very angry and his wrath burned within him. There is a crisis in the kingdom. Ahasuerus wife won't do what he says. You know, what would you do if Ahasuerus were your friend? Set aside what his, his advisors told him. Set aside the fact that he probably could just kill people who disagreed with him. If this were your friend, what would you want to say to him? You know, wouldn't you want to bring him some perspective? Hey, I, I know you wanted her to do something and she didn't, but you know, remember, you have 127 provinces. You know, re- remember, you have this great feast going on. Think about the guests. Or, or even just, here, eat some more food. You'll feel better. You know, he has all of these good things. But one thing in the kingdom is out of place. And he completely loses perspective. The world stops for him. And, and I expect that sometimes your world stops too. Has anything ever happened in your kingdom? You know, the, the kid didn't come quite as quickly as they were supposed to. Uh, you know, the... The door stuck as you were walking out. You, you know, these, these tiny little things that happen and they, they completely uh, uh, consume our minds. We need to pause and notice when this happens to us. We, we need to have a little bit of self-awareness to be able to say, why am I angry? Why am I so mad right now? Why am I so frustrated? 
you know, you can try, try to play that out and defend it. Jonah tried that, you remember. Uh, first of all, he's frustrated because God had compassion on people. He didn't destroy people. But then uh, God gave him a plant that grew up, and then the plant died, and Jonah was very angry about the plant. And so God asked him, do you do well to be angry? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Yeah, this is life and death. This is my whole world right now. And I'm mad, and I'm not going to stop. And what God did for Jonah is what we need God to do for us. God gave him some perspective. Think about this, Jonah. Think about compassion. Think about love. Think about all of these other things that are going on. That's what we need to be able to do as well. When our kingdoms become undone, when we're frustrated, when we're losing control. Again, the perspective that we need most fundamentally is to get our heads out of our own kingdoms. To move over to the kingdom of God and think about that. Think again about Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, so the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, are you able to recognize how out of control your own kingdom is? And how incompetent you are to deal with that? And how much you sin and do wrong? And are you able to give that over to me? Are you able to say, I'm not, I'm not really rich, I'm poor. Um, I don't really have so much to celebrate and show off. I, I need to mourn for, for my sin and my error. I'm, I'm one who needs to be humble and gentle. I'm one who needs a righteousness that's outside of me. I need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus says, if you can recognize that, then you are blessed. But of course, he, he doesn't simply present his kingdom as, as something that, you know, add this to your kingdom. Add the kingdom of God to, to your kingdom so you can control your happiness too. No, this is a submission to God. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's that second part describe? It describes obedience even unto death if necessary. This is a real understanding that there's righteousness, there's a certain way I'm to live. If Jesus is king, I receive his blessing as he fills me up with what I don't have, but I also commit myself to obey, even to the point of persecution. This is what will get us outside of our kingdom. So, so next time you have a kingdom crisis... Uh, Next time something doesn't go quite the way it's supposed to and you feel a little angry, pause and think about the kingdom of God. Give yourself some perspective. Remember the words of Jesus Christ. So take note of kingdom crises. Finally, we learn as we look at Ahasuerus what we also need to do. You need to learn to laugh at your kingdom comedy. You need to learn to laugh at your kingdom comedy. This This chapter in Esther, I think, is probably the funniest chapter in the Bible. Uh, And I know the Bible is not usually funny. But this time it is funny, and it's funny on purpose. And I want to show you uh, the humor that's built into this chapter and, and then also explain why this book began with the story of Persia. There's, there's no t- discussion of God or of God's people or anything. It's just a story about King Ahasuerus. Listen to how it goes on. The king said to the wise men who understood the times, for it was the custom of the king, so to speak, before all who knew law and justice and were close to him, Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marcina, and Memukon, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who had access to the king's presence and sat first in the kingdom. Uh, This is... Uh, you know, the seven, the seven great leaders. Recently, I think there was a, a G7 summit. That's, this is the G7 summit. This is, this is the top leaders in all uh, the world uh, that are being called together by a king so that 
they can give legal advice and solve problems. And the king says, men, there's a problem in my marriage. My wife won't listen to me. What should I do? You know, imagine our world leaders getting together and discussing something like that. We, we would think, what's going on? How, how could this possibly be a, a serious topic? But, but it is a serious topic because there's a monarch here, and the monarch says this is what, this is what the best legal minds in the, in the whole empire need to think about. And so they go into it. I, I wish that I could say it. I, I want to imagine these men kind of laughing to themselves. I've, it seems that they took this pretty seriously too, though. Uh, and, and had bought into this idea that Ahasuerus really is the whole world. And so they say, well, let's, let's figure this problem out. How big, a, how big of a deal is this? And, and they come, verse 16, Queen Vashti is wrong, not only the king, but also all the princes and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. Her not coming into your presence, she literally sinned against every household in all 127 provinces. That's, what they, that's, that's their diagnosis of the situation, that, that she has done this huge, terrible thing. And so, of course, it needs uh, to be dealt with. Of course, something needs to happen. Because if, if people hear, hear the consequences, if people hear about this disobedience, every single wife in the entire empire is going to disobey her husband. We've got to solve that problem. So, what are we going to do uh, about uh, these, this disobedient wife? Well, first of all, the, the solution is, well, we need to fire your wife. Um, she can't be queen anymore. She, she can't come into your presence anymore. Of course, that's what she just said she didn't want to do, so it's hard to see that as a punishment against her, but she's not allowed to come anymore. Uh, she needs to, to go back probably to the harem where all the other wives would have been. She can't have the special position anymore. And then we need to send out a royal proclamation because here's the problem. Everybody in the kingdom might hear about this. So let's write it down and tell them all. Let's, let's write down what just happened, uh, this terrible situation, and let's send it out to everyone in the entire empire and say, here's the story about how Ahasuerus' wife disobeyed him. I can't imagine a better way to make sure that every wife in the entire empire would know what's going on and would have her private laugh at what happened. But, of course, they, they treat the whole thing with much gravity, and they say, uh, we're going to do this, we're going to send it out, and then here's going to be the result. When this proclamation is read that come from, came from the very top of government, every single woman in this entire empire is going to say to herself, I really just want to do whatever my husband says. And all the men will be happy. I think they're out of touch with how people work. I don't think they have any clue what's going on and, and what's actually going to happen with this. I think probably nothing happened. Probably everybody had a, had a quiet chuckle to themselves and got on with life after this decree came out. Uh, but... But for Ahasuerus and for all of these advisors, this is, this is this massive thing that they're doing to show their authority and their power, to show the control that they have over all the people. And God gives it to us, I think, so that we can just smile at them and say, is that, is that really the king of the world? Is that really what he's up to and what he can do? Uh, he's, he's a fool. And his advisors are fools. It's, it's worth asking ourselves as we think about Ahasuerus. He, he took himself so seriously. He was so important. I wonder how seriously we take ourselves sometimes. Uh, some, some advice I heard once was take your job seriously. Don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, and I liked that because... The, the work, the, the life is not all a joke. There are, there are many serious things in life. There are things that we need to give proper attention to, but there are always times because we're people that we do foolish things that are, that are funny. Are you able to laugh at yourself? Are you able to recognize that you're not so all important that everything about your life is serious? Or maybe an, a better way to diagnose this question uh, are the people that you work with able to laugh 
at you? Or, or, or do people, is your family able to laugh when you do something silly? Or, or do people walk around you on eggshells because they know this person, no matter what they do, it's always serious, they'll explode if, if, I, if I mention anything. Are you able to laugh? Why, why would God want us to think about these sorts of things? Why would God give us this chapter? Uh, that's, that's just the story of the great King Ahasuerus being a fool. Part, part of the answer, of course, is we need some of this information to read the rest of the book. It, it is setting up the rest of the story, but I don't think that's the whole answer. Because the next several chapters in the book of Esther are, are going to deal with some, some topics and some issues that are not funny at all. Uh, in fact, this, this book, just as it, as it raises the comedy of King Ahasuerus, is, is preparing to dive into some, some very serious subject matters. Great evil that was done to people and evil that was done by people. And it will, again, just as with this chapter, we can start to see ourselves in the story. Again, I think we'll start to see ourselves in the story. And we'll have some serious things to think about of what's been done to us and by us and what's going on in this life. But God wants us to start with laughter. And the reason is that because this is the sort of thing that God laughs at. The Bible doesn't talk about God laughing very much. You may know one of the places that it does, Psalm 2. Listen to what God says, Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Why is God laughing? It's because he can't really take them seriously as a threat. Remember, this is the kings of the world. This is, this is Ahasuerus and everybody like him. Uh, banding together to fight against God, and God just, just can't help but laugh a little bit because he, they're not a serious threat. And God wants us, if we are a part of his kingdom, to remember the bigger picture. King Ahasuerus, the king, can do some terrible things to God's people, which as they happened, I'm sure, were not laughing matters. But God gives us the story, and he says, I want you to step way back, and I want you to remember, first of all, that King Ahasuerus, in the big picture of the kingdom of God and what God is doing, he's a joke. And maybe there are kingdoms that control your life quite a bit. Uh, maybe there are, there are things that are out of your control and, and things that tempt you to, to be scared. And, and yes, take things seriously as, as they come, but remember this bigger picture. All those who oppose God will be shown in the end to be fools. Fools who are deserving to be laughed at. And God wants his people to have that sense of relief and that sense of hope and that sense of joy that says he is in control. And so I, I hope that you're able to laugh at your own kingdom a little bit from time to time. I hope that you can learn to look at other kingdoms and laugh at what's going on this, in this world. But as you do that, it, it won't be the, you know, the scornful laughter of thinking we're better than others, but the laughter of relief that says God is in control. God's kingdom rules over all. And I trust in God's King, Jesus. We've, we've listened to the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. I want us to close listening to Jesus one more time. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. 
Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell. And great was its fall. Let's pray together. Lord, we are all kingdom builders, as you've made us to be. We have all built poorly at times. Help us to build upon the rock. Lord, we all live in the kingdoms that others have built, with many things out of our control, with many who have much more power than we do. Help us as we navigate these these kingdoms, sometimes in very difficult ways, to remember the greatest kingdom of all. Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see the kingdom of God, that we would not just build a show here on this earth, uh, that we would not uh, be overwhelmed with our own sense of importance and our own frustrations and angers, but help us to see that you are at work in this world. Help us uh, to laugh with relief as we remember that the best that this world can do is nothing compared to your power, that you are in control and that your king sits on Zion, that Jesus reigns. And we pray in his name. Amen.